Hello everyone and welcome back to J1 Aviation. So on this channel we like to review a couple questions from the FAA private pilot test prep. So you've likely heard by now that the FAA has revoked Trevor Jacobs pilot certificate saying that he operated the aircraft in a reckless and careless manner. So this is citing FAR 9113 which says the following. No person may operate an aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another. Now because on this channel we review private pilot test questions, today we are going to review some questions that I believe Trevor may have incorrectly answered when he took his knowledge test based on what we know has happened so far. Of course I have no idea, but these are just a few potential questions on the test related to this whole fiasco. So question number one, except when necessary for takeoff or landing, what is the minimum safe altitude for a pilot to operate an aircraft anywhere? A, an altitude allowing if a power unit fails, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. B, an altitude of 500 feet above the surface and no closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure or C, an altitude of 500 feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of 1,000 feet. So the answer here is A. Except when taken off or landing, an aircraft should always be operated at an altitude high enough to permit an emergency landing without endangering people or property on the ground. And this is part of where the careless and reckless operation comes in. So it's good practice when we're out flying around to keep this in mind. If I have an engine failure right now, do I have a decent place to land without creating a hazard to persons or property on the ground. So I mean, as a general rule of thumb, if you have limited landing options, maybe it'd be better to fly at a higher altitude if that's an option. That'll give you more time plus more options if things should not go according to plan. Okay, so question number two. The operator of an aircraft that has been involved in an accident is required to file an NTSB accident report within how many days? Seven, 10, or five? So the answer here is 10 days. The operator of an aircraft shall file an NTSB accident report within 10 days after the accident. Now there is so much speculation and rumors out there. There was rumors that he didn't realize he had to file anything after an accident. So the proper answer here is that you need to file a report within 10 days after the accident. Okay, question number three. The operator of an aircraft that has been involved in an incident is required to submit a report to the nearest field office of the NTSB within 10 days, when requested, or within seven days. So the answer here is B. For an incident, you only need to file a report when it is requested. So giving him the benefit of the doubt, maybe he was confused accident versus incident requirements. So let's review each of these. The definition of these terms is in 49 CFR Part 830, which is right before the aim starts in this book. Or you can search online. So accident means death or serious injury has occurred, or the aircraft receives substantial damage. And then they define some of these terms. Serious injury is then defined, hospital stay over 48 hours, broken bones, and a few other things. Substantial damage means damage which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of an aircraft, which would require you know, major repair or replacement of those components. And seeing the end result of that aircraft, it looks like that would be substantial damage. So this would qualify as an accident. Then it lists those things which are not substantial damage. Things like engine failure, dented skin, ground damage for propeller blades. So these are not substantial damage and wouldn't require an accident report to be filed. Now an incident means some occurrence other than an accident associated with the operation of an aircraft which affects or could affect safety operations. So if he had an engine failure, landed safely somewhere on the ground, this would be an incident and then only be required to file a report if requested. So maybe there was some confusion there, I can't say. So question number four, if an in-flight emergency requires immediate action, the pilot in command may deviate from any rule of 14 CFR part 91 to the extent required to meet the emergency, 
but must submit a written report to the administrator within 24 hours, or B, deviate from any rule of 14 CFR Part 91 to the extent required to meet that emergency, or C, not deviate from any rule of 14 CFR Part 91 unless prior to the deviation approval is granted by the administrator. So the answer here is B. The pilot may deviate from any rule of 14 CFR Part 91 to the extent required to meet that emergency. A written report is only required to be submitted if requested. So the FAA is going uh, after Trevor on this catch-all regulation 9113 that he operated the aircraft in a careless or reckless way. Now I'm going to go way out on the limb here. In fact, as farthest out on the limb as you can go and say potentially Trevor could come back to the FAA and say according to this FAR he is allowed to deviate from any rule of this part to meet that emergency. So I'm not sure the FAA would buy that based on all the footage we have but that would be an interesting conversation. Okay the last question for today may aircraft wreckage be moved prior to the time the NTSB takes custody? No, it may not be moved under any circumstances. Yes, but only to prevent the wreckage from further damage. Yes, but only if moved by a federal, state, or local law enforcement officer. So the answer here is B. Yes, there are three instances that are pointed out where wreckage can be moved. Uh, the first one is to remove persons injured or trapped from the wreckage, right? The second one is to protect the wreckage from further damage. And then the last one is to protect the public from injury. So it makes sense that the wreckage can be moved in any of these cases. I don't know if any of these cases were pertinent in the crash from Trevor. Okay, so there you go. A little recap of a couple FARs and potentially some questions that Trevor may have guessed incorrectly on his knowledge test. Maybe not. Maybe he got them all correct. Um, but this is a good reminder why we as pilots need to be continually studying and learning to keep these regulations fresh in our mind. So thanks everyone for riding along today. We hope you join us on our future flight and thanks for flying J1 Aviation.